Happy August, everyone. Welcome to Digital Charcuterie. My name is Andrew Fantasia. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is the place where we talk a whole lot of Marvel United and DC Superheroes United, as well as some other little things here and there, whatever catches our fancy. Today, our fancy, well, my fancy, let's be real, has been caught by the notion of ranking some folks, some blue and red and purple plastic folks, primarily. That's right. I did this with Multiverse. Now it's time to do this with DC. I am going to rank every character in DC Superheroes United based on my excitement for each character. I will put an asterisk on that. The only characters I did not rank are the sidekick pet guys, the yellow guys, and the gray supporting characters, only because as a person who still has not even gotten Marvel United Multiverse, I really don't know how pet slash sidekicks and how support characters are going to work and whether or not I'm going to enjoy playing with them. I, I really have no frame of reference for what those characters are going to feel like on the board. So there's no yellow animals on this list and there's no gray support characters on this list, but I mean, really super quickly, when it comes to support, in order of what has me least to most excited, um, I'm going to go Jimmy Gordon, Lois, Alfred. There it is. Okay. Now, on to the characters. Before we get to that, though, please like and subscribe and uh, do all that other stuff that you might do here on YouTube. And maybe consider, if you are a fantasy fan, checking out my fantasy novels, We Were Wizards, which I wrote and self-published, and they are available on Amazon right now in multiple formats. If you don't like hardcovers and you prefer ebooks, yeah, you can get an ebook too and a paperback. It's all good. We Were Wizards is a fun, old-fashioned family adventure. Ixnay on the family part. It's not dark or, you know, this isn't Game of Thrones or anything, but I don't know why I said family. It just kind of fit well into that sentence. But you are going to enjoy these if you're a fantasy fan. If you know somebody who's a fantasy fan, they're going to love them. So hop on over to Amazon and consider helping out an up-and-coming author. Now that that's all out of the way, let's talk about the heroes, villains, and dual-mode characters that DC Superheroes and Edited is giving us and how excited I am for them in reverse order. Um, I tried to categorize these like I did with Marvel, but it was a little bit too complicated and sticky, so I just thought, forget that. Consider the categories extremely malleable in this case, all right? So let's just get to it. Let's start from the bottom of the list and work our way up. Here goes. If you know me by now, you probably know that my least excited one is Batman Armored Version. And it's for no other reason other than I'm much more of a fan of getting new characters we don't have already than I am of just characters wearing different skins and costumes. And that's precisely what Batman Armored is. Yes, theoretically, you could make the uh, distinction and say that it's not a skin, it's a variant. It's the Dark Knight Returns variant. And that's probably what I will do in my headcanon because the multiverse is definitely a thing in DC. And don't be surprised if future seasons embrace that. But for now, Batman Armored is at the bottom of my list, not because I don't like him, but because somebody has to be there. Right above him is Robin the Dick Grayson version. And again, that's not a knock against him at all. It's really just the fact that we also have Nightwing, who is also Dick Grayson. And in the general scheme of things, even though this is the Robin I grew up with, both in the cartoon and in the 60s show, now I kind of always associate Dick with Nightwing and Tim with Robin. That's the only reason he's here. Really, that's it. In my mind, I just see him as another skin. But I love the idea of having every Robin possible because one day the thought of having an all-Robin team-up sounds really, really fun to me. Coming in next is Crypto, the super dog. Because honestly, I just really don't know anything about Crypto. He fits in here. He's a dog from Krypton, I'm assuming. Moving on, Rick Flag, our first Winky Pinky Poo Poo character. Rick Flag is just the the most boring member of the Suicide Squad, at least, you know, if I have anything to say about it. He's just a, a guy who's like, hey, I have guns and I'm going to lead the Suicide Squad. You know, there's nothing really colorful or interesting about him. He kind of fits in here. Right above him is Stripe, the big old robot man who hangs out with Stargirl. And he's only here because he doesn't look as interesting as just most of the other characters, right? He's just a, a guy in a 
big robot suit. He's kind of like a miniature iron giant. Next is Trigon, the big old demon. I did not know Trigon existed before this game. So that's always fun to me. I love finding out about new characters. So far, on the surface level, though, he just looks like a giant generic demon. And I know that DC Comics has quite a few of those. I haven't seen the Black Adam movie, but I know that Sabak, the villain in that movie, is a giant generic looking demon too. So I have him this low on the list just because I'm waiting to see what makes this particular giant generic demon less generic. What makes him special, right? Why is he a big deal besides his size? So that's why he's here. Coming next is Plastic Man. And that's only because I really, I have a particular bias in the world of DC. My go-to stretchy hero is Elongated Man because he his nose twitches and he solves mysteries and it's just, it, it's really cool. He's just a much more fun character and I know nothing about Plastic Man except that he exists, right? I, I didn't don't know anything about him story-wise or personality-wise or anything. I'm much more of an Elongated Man fellow, so that's why Plastic Man's here. Next is Wildcat and... I think, honestly, from here on out, I can say that I am genuinely really excited for all of these characters in United Form. Everybody before this, I'm fine with, but they're just people that I'm not so much excited as I am curious. From here on out, I am curious and excited. So Wildcat is, uh, he's you know, he's just a JSA guy who likes the box and he's a big old bruiser and uh, he's usually got bandages on his nose. He's just a classic fun character, but he just happens to fall right here, right underneath Adam Smasher. Another character I did not know anything about until I saw the trailer for the Black Adam movie and I feel like I should turn in my DC fan card because I've read a fair bit of the modern stuff around the New 52 era and I don't remember ever seeing this guy so I feel bad that I don't know who he is but he's a big oversized miniature so that gets me excited. Next is Batgirl, the Cassandra Kane version. I think this is a late 90s slash early 2000s version of, of Batgirl because the only time I ever remember seeing her in anything was I had this really cheap, um, I say cheap, but it was decent. It was this Batman board game called Gotham City Mystery. I think, and she was one of the four playable characters, uh, and that's the only place I know her from. Normally, my Batgirl is the one in the purple and yellow, so that's why she falls here. Sticking in the Batman world, the next character is the Joker, and I know, here comes people calling me a blasphemer, but folks, I put the Joker this low because, I'm sorry, <laughs> fast forward if you don't want to hear this, but I think he is the most overrated villain in comics, period. He's just overused, overdone, too much. I don't think he's bad. He's just, it's too much. Oversaturation of Jokers. I'm, I'm done with the Joker. Uh, but he is a classic character, and I want classic characters. So, of course, I'm happy to see him here, and I'm excited to play him. I really like his mechanic. That's why he falls here. Next, I am putting the trifecta of the Wonder Twins and Gleek, just because... The, you know, other than the fact that I think it's funny that they included them, I'm not really uh, very sure what to expect with them, but I'm excited that they're here. So I guess in the order of excitement, let's put Jaina at the bottom and then Zan just because he has water, so his mini's a little cooler, and then Gleek on top because he's a lovable little monkey and his cards involve him going after bananas. So come on, that's, he has to be at the top of this. Next is Deadshot, another, I was going to say anti-hero, Another, you know, you know what? I'm just going to call it a hint I hero because dual mode does not roll off the tongue that well. Uh, but Deadshot is here just because he's a stalwart old Batman villain, but there are far more interesting Batman villains and far more interesting DC villains in general. So a guy who's just DC's bullseye, this is a perfect slot for him. Etrigan is next, a demon that fights for the good side. I only really have uh, Batman the Animated Series knowledge of this guy, so... I'm excited for him, but my knowledge of him is limited. Next is Despero, who's been a big-time alien villain for a long time, so I'm very happy to see Despero show up in the game. He's one I didn't expect, and he's a villain I always kind of forget about, but he's classic. I shouldn't forget about him. That's my fault. Coming next is Gorilla Grodd, our first big Flash villain on the list, and I don't really dislike anything about Gorilla Grodd, but, you know, the Flash villain's got to start somewhere, so 
he falls right here, right underneath the Atom, who is just an awesome all-around DC hero, and I really look forward to having him on the board. I love when uh, Marvel United has played with the idea of the characters who can shrink have their miniatures almost as their actual size, right? Like Ant-Man on the quarter, Wasp on the dice, and now Atom on a Batarang. I want more of those. I want more of the tiny heroes popping up, and do some tiny villains too. Do Mr. Mind. Uh, this makes me really happy. Next is Lex Luthor, who, I'm going to say it, there still has not, in my opinion, there has not been a good cinematic version of Lex Luthor. There's been a great TV version. I think Michael Rosenbaum nailed it, but I'm still waiting to see a good Lex Luthor in a movie. Sorry, Gene Hackman. You didn't cut it for me. There's just another classic DC villain. I like him way more than I like the Joker, and I'm excited to have him here. Though I do prefer fancy suit Luthor to battle mech Luthor. That's just me. I just like him in the black suit. And now it's Harley Quinn time, just because she is one of the first purple characters we thought of when DC Superheroes United got announced, right? We all kind of went there. Our brains went to, oh, we're going to get a purple Harley Quinn. And sure enough, we did. She's become mega popular. I am a much bigger fan of her classic look than the look that we've been getting in the modern era with the pigtails and everything, but I'm sure we're getting the classic look, and I mean, one Harley's as good as another at the end of the day. Next is Red Tornado, the vision of the DC Universe. He is a character that I don't see pop up too often in any of the stories I read, but I I know he's just classic. I know he, he's Justice League adjacent. I like the idea of having him here because it would feel weird if he was left out. Next is the Batman who laughs, who I'll be honest, it wouldn't feel weird if he was left out because he's so new. He might even be the newest character on this list, unless I'm mistaken. But his lack of longevity notwithstanding, he has become a huge hit with the people who read Dark Knight's Metal. So I'm really glad that modern comics fans have a new classic modern comics character to add to the list. The, the thing about comics is they can get very stagnant because they are, at the end of the day, four-color soap operas. So very little change happens to the status quo in comic books. And when you get a new character, which happens often, they usually don't stick around and become classic. So when that ends up being the case, when you do get a character who sticks around and becomes classic, like, say, Miles Morales or Miss Marvel or the Batman who laughs, I like seeing that. And I'm sure comic fans like seeing that too. So Welcome aboard, Batman Who Laughs. Coming up next is Jonah Hex, who I'm assuming is going to be much more fun than his movie, which I haven't seen, so I can't make fun of it. But from what I hear, ugh, you can't see me, but I'm tugging at my collar right now. It's supposed to be pretty lame. Jonah Hex is uh, one of the, the Western heroes of DC, the preeminent Western hero of DC, and DC has a lot of Wild West comics, so I'm glad they brought him, and now I'm curious if they're going to open up a little bit more of his Wild West world. They kind of did with Solomon Grundy, I guess. That's about it. All right, next is Power Girl, who, again, she's just like Red Tornado. She's not a main heavy Justice League hitter, but she's adjacent to that. I don't know what you would call those characters, but I, I just like calling them Justice League adjacent. Power Girl falls into that category very nicely, and I wanted to see her in here, and we got her. So, moving on to Brainiac, who has a very, very cool miniature. Love me some villains sitting in thrones, and Brainiac looks like he's going to be more interesting than some of his other iterations. I find Brainiac can be hit or miss, for example, the idea of how he operated in, say, like, Injustice or Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, that doesn't really do it for me, where it's just, ooh, I'm a big guy with tentacles and a ship. I don't know, Brainiac, I feel, is at his most interesting when he's kind of like a Kryptonian HAL 9000, and when he's got the, the really bright green and purple look to him, as opposed to just looking like if Dr. Octopus and Cyborg had a baby and that baby grew up in Zack Snyder's house. So I'm glad they went with a more classic, colorful version of Brainiac. Speaking of classic and colorful, Killer Croc is next. He's just another solid Batman villain, and you'll see a lot of them on this list, of course. I didn't really get into Killer Croc much because he was not in the cartoons too much, just a few times. He really started to shine for me when I saw him in the Arkham Asylum games, but he's fun, and he would be sorely missed if he wasn't here. And we're staying on that villain train and we're pulling into Station Cheetah. All aboard for Cheetah. This is a big deal for me because she's kind of a character that I really love to see and I almost never get 
to see. Uh, she just gets overlooked, right? Wonder Woman villains really get overshadowed by the Batman and Superman villains. So to see them get some love makes me smile. And Cheetah in particular is kind of the Joker of the Wonder Woman rogues gallery. So absolutely she needs to be here. I was very happy when I saw she was in the core box. Cyclone is next. One of the other characters I knew nothing about until this game. Uh, she seems cool though. She seems nice. She throws tornadoes around, but she's different from Red Tornado, so I'm looking forward to it. And her costume is green, which is rare for superheroes, so yeah, good stuff. Stargirl. Uh, I just like her look. I love that she's surfing on her star rod there. I love whenever a character has like a magic rod or a magic staff, just because I love wizards so much. I mean, I am a guy who writes about them after all, so I should like wizards. Uh, but that's why just Stargirl makes me happy just seeing her here. Red Hood. Gonna be honest, my least favorite character in the Bat family. Just because, you know, Jason Todd coming back from the dead. I'm just not a guy who likes the idea of characters coming back from the dead. And I know comics do that every single day. But for me, it's a much more interesting story that he does not survive. And Batman lives with that guilt and tries training Robins with that guilt. But Red Hood is a purple character. So that's awesome because you can be him as a hero and fight him as a villain. So I'm really happy he's in the game. I'm also really happy Black Mask is in the game and I did not expect to see him. He seems like such a underdog villain in the grand scheme of things that I wouldn't expect a United game to throw him in. He is after all just a guy in a suit with a funky looking head but he's here and he's carrying that cool looking trident weapon and he's standing on a briefcase of money. He definitely has one of the cooler miniatures in this campaign but Definitely not the coolest either. Captain Boomerang is next. Uh, this guy's just a longtime classic Flash villain. And thankfully, my buddy the Meeple Monkey can finally have an Australian character to play as in a United game. And now we can do that whole uh, Australia and America and England and, and, you know, the thing he tried to do with all the characters from every country fighting the good fight. Now we can have that finally happen. Next is Parasite. He deserves some more love. Uh, he's pretty scary, especially the fact that he can to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superman makes him particularly scary because he not only goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, but he uh, eliminates some of those toes by draining his powers. So yikes. Constantine is next. He's been uh, portrayed uh, in very, very fun ways, especially in the uh, Legends of Tomorrow show. So I've Constantine has grown on me and I love the supernatural world in general. So yeah. I'm happy he's here. And the little fire effect is nice, too. Raven with her big cloak flapping in the wind, another supernatural character. I'm happy to see her here, and I'm happy to say that her miniature looks every bit as cool as she deserves it to look. Solomon Grundy falls in here. A Batman villain that I really always kind of take or leave. What puts him this high on the list for me is the fact that they really played with the whole nursery rhyme, days of the week thing with him and made it a little bit of a meta mini game while you're playing as him. And I think that's just wild and so awesome. It's the developers who made Solomon Grundy this exciting for me. So, so cool. Bloodsport is next uh, because he falls in that lovely little category of characters who I knew about but never imagined we would get in the game. I read about this guy once a long time ago and then I saw him in the Suicide Squad movie and that was it. I did not think he was anywhere near popular enough to qualify for DC Superheroes United but shows what I know baby because we got Bloodsport. Clayface is next and primarily I have Clayface here excitement wise because I think they're doing really fun things with his morphing ability. And I also think it's one of the absolute best representations of taking a character and putting them into chibi form without losing any kind of integrity of the character. And that's hard to do. So credit to the artist because Clayface has a certain look to him. And if you get that wrong, he just kind of looks like a muddy mess, but they didn't get that wrong. They nailed the look of Clayface here. Ares is next. The other big heavy hitting villain in Wonder Woman's rogues gallery. Character that I wasn't quite expecting to see. He wasn't as big a surprise as Bloodsport, not by a long shot. But he really just doesn't get the kind of love. Just like Cheetah. Like Wonder Woman villains get so overlooked. So the fact that he is here and the fact that he is going to be uh, the type of villain where you can't really injure him because he is a god. But he's going to try to make the world go to war with each other. Design wise... He's just incredible. 
Next is Peacemaker. And Peacemaker falls under here just because he's a lot of fun. I loved his trading card growing up, so I'm happy to see him here. And as a dual mode character to boot. Superboy. He is a character I grew up reading. I say grew up reading. I really only had like two comics with him in it, but I read them ad nauseum. So technically I did grow up reading him, just <laughs> not progressing much in that regard. But man, am I ever glad he's here. I'm also glad Batwoman is here. I know very little about her, but I've caught glimpses of her in 52 and that's it. And what I've caught, I've really enjoyed. So I want to see some more Batwoman action. Now I can have my own Batwoman adventures on the table. Fantastic. Man Bat. This guy is the first ever episode of not only Batman, the animated series, but the whole DC animated universe in general, was a show about Man Bat. So even though he's not like a vintage golden age comic book villain, to me he's as classic as they come when it comes to Batman villains. Like, I can't leave him out. Uh, so I'm glad that they didn't leave him out either. And his miniature looks dope. Robin, Damian Wayne. He's just, this is a nice little slot for him. I have not seen anything or read anything that has Damian Wayne's Robin in it. So I don't know anything about his personality, what he's like. I just know he is the current Robin. And that's exciting. I like Robins. So bring on the Robins. Next is Lobo, who's the main man, who's the intergalactic bounty hunter. Uh, that's doesn't quite sound like Lobo. But Lobo sounds like Brad Garrett. We all know that. And that was not a good Brad Garrett. I apologize. But Lobo was a big, big talking point in the comments. And I'm happy to see him. Of course, he's purple. He has to be purple. If he wasn't, there would be rioting in the streets. Beast Boy is next. God, I love his miniature. Standing on that sign. It's just, it's so simple, but it's just so super heroic. And then to top it all off, his mechanic is gorgeous. All of that different artwork, all of those different green animals. I remember in the early 90s when he was still called Changeling. I think I like Changeling better as a name, but I don't care, man. Beast Boy is awesome. Poison Ivy. Uh, now we're getting into some real Batman villain juicy goodness. Now we can kind of reenact uh, Batman and Robin if we want to. Uh, somebody, Somebody's going to make a Batman and Robin uh, campaign. It's probably going to be Diversion Architect. Somebody else doesn't beat him to it. But man, I'm looking forward to that. Hal Jordan is next. I'm a guy who loves Green Lantern, but I will be honest, Hal Jordan is my least favorite of the Green Lanterns just because I don't find him as interesting as the others. But that doesn't matter. I'm still so excited for Hal Jordan in this. His miniature looks incredible. He's too classic to leave out. He's got to be here. Love it. Black Lightning is next. Principal of a high school with lightning powers and his whole family gets involved. Great, great story. I love the idea of having Black Lightning here. Another what I would call Justice League adjacent big heavy hitting character. Rachel Ghoul, one of the Batman villains I expected to see, but I did not expect to see in a season one. I couldn't even tell you why. Maybe it's because I thought they would pace themselves with Batman villains. I thought they would spread the Batman villain love throughout multiple seasons, but no, they really just kind of, they front loaded them and that's totally fine. That's just not what I was expecting. But man, am I glad he's here because he's, he's, kind of he's kind of a big deal in the Batman world and they utilize his Lazarus Pit thing beautifully. Captain Cold is next and I am so glad they made him purple. He spent so much time as an anti-hero in uh, Legends of Tomorrow and from what I gather he's very much an anti-hero in the Jeff Johns Flash comic run so he's just too cool, no pun intended, to stay as simply a bad guy. Next is Guy Gardner, my next favorite Green Lantern and the reason that I only like him this much uh, in terms of a character, it's just because he's kind of a jerk. Uh, that's part of his charm for most people, but he just looks awesome with his baseball bat, and it's really exciting. The, the prospect of playing as Guy Gardner is really exciting because I want to see how they utilize the fact that he's a jerk in his cards. I know there's going to be at least one blank card with nothing on the bottom. There has to be because he is so not a team player. So I can't wait to see how the cards basically spell out how much of a D-I-C-K this guy is. Next is Steppenwolf. I mean, just his presence kind of got me really excited for the prospect of more of the new gods, particularly the, the dark ones from Apocalypse. And though we didn't go that route this season, I think Steppenwolf is a promise, a whisper, if you will, of things to come. So I'm happy he's here. And for the meanwhile, while we wait for a season two down the road, hopefully a little far down the road so we can get Marvel season four first. But in the meantime we can reenact the plot of Justice League, the movie, if we want, because we've got everybody now. Talia al Ghul. Here's a character I never expected to see 
in United, at least not as a main villain. I totally figured she would be some kind of henchman for Ra's al Ghul. Of course, she would figure into the story, but they made her a villain, and that makes me so happy. And I felt the exact same way when they made her the main villain of The Dark Knight Rises as, like, that twist ending. I just thought, wow, they actually went there. That I love that movie. And now, here she is again, surprising me once more, this time in board game form. Talia al Ghul is, like, the, the, the birthday surprise party of Batman villains. She just keeps popping up unexpectedly and making me smile. Sticking in Batman's world, it's Catwoman's turn. Another quintessential purple character, right? A character who needed to be purple, and we all knew she needed to be purple going into this campaign, and voila, she's purple. And hey, she even used to wear purple, so it fits her like a glove. Next is Katana. Uh, I love her look, I love her soul eater sword, I love everything about her. She's awesome, so... This is where Katana lives. Next, I did an interesting thing. I kind of compiled the whole Justice League together in this chunk of the list because I think this is around halfway through the list. And I did that because I feel like the Justice League, we all expected them to be here so much that it's not even a surprise. Like The Justice League has to be in this game. So it's not a matter of, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're here. It's more a matter of, yeah, we know that they're supposed to be here. They are the free space on the bingo cards, uh, to, to put it away, that, that Meeple Monkey would have put it a few uh, weeks ago. So I stuck them all here, and in the order of excitement of the Justice League, I have the Flash first. Because now we know how his cards are going to work, how his speed is going to work, it looks awesome. But he's just my least favorite member of the Justice League for no real particular reason. So he goes here, followed by Cyborg, who used to be my least favorite just because I found him boring. The idea of just like, oh, I'm a guy who's a cyborg. But man, when I saw how they handled him in the Justice League movie, the, the Snyder version of the Justice League movie, his powers were handled so beautifully that he became the shining beacon of that movie. And now I find Cyborg way more interesting. Next is Batman. And he's only this low on the Justice League list because there are a bunch of games, video and board, where you can be Batman. But with the following Justice Leaguers, there really aren't many games at all where you can step into their boots. So I'm more excited for them, namely Aquaman, who I don't think is the joke everybody else seems to think he is. I loved his first movie. I love the idea of Atlantis and that whole world. I think it's gorgeous. And next is Wonder Woman. Again, I love her whole world, Themyscira and all the Amazons and all of her rogues gallery, which is obviously not as great as the other rogues galleries, but still very good and still quite underrated and I can't think of the last time any game of any kind let me play as Wonder Woman so yeah she's much higher on the list followed only by Superman because there are so few games that let me step into Superman's shoes mostly due to the obvious reason that he's so overpowered much like Wonder Woman herself really the two of them that it would be hard to make such a game challenging. Thankfully, we have pros like Andrea Chiarvesio on our side, so he and the rest of the dev team made sure to make them challenging enough. Okay, next we have Spoiler. We're moving on from the Justice League to Spoiler, a character that I discovered reading a couple of Robin comics growing up, and I didn't think anybody else really cared about her, but I'm happy to see her here. She's followed very closely by Nightwing, because Dick Grayson is part of the Bat family, and I like the idea of Robin more than I like the idea of Nightwing, but again, Again, to me, Tim Drake is Robin, so I'm putting Nightwing right around here. Mongol, I didn't learn about him until years into my adulthood when I started reading some DC comics, and he really popped up in so many of them, I didn't realize he was such a big deal. At first I thought he was Diet Darkseid, but I was proven wrong. Mongol's cool. I almost forgot to include him on the list, but Black Hand is next. This is where he falls. Black Hand was never my favorite Green Lantern villain, but he's appeared in so many of the Green Lantern stories I've read that to me, he's an essential Green Lantern villain, right? You gotta have him. Plus, he's part of the War of Light. He's the Black Lantern. Ah, so much fun. Vixen is next, the lady with the tattoo totem. She's awesome. She's so much fun. Another hero who utilizes the powers of animals in a very supernatural, awesome way. Next is Green Arrow. So I'm happy to see Green Arrow, and I know a lot of other people were happy to see the Green Arrow. Bane. Um, and I don't know, should I do the rest of this? Talking like Bane from the movie? Because he excited me when he showed up in the campaign. I'm not going to do that the whole time. I apologize. But Bane is really, really fun. I love the fact that he's so hulking and he's got all of his tubes. We're one step closer to reenacting Batman and Robin. You're welcome. Next is Black Adam, who primarily made me really excited. And I'm sure a lot of other fans were really excited because he was the beacon of purple light that told us, worry not, 
We are indeed getting anti-heroes in this campaign. They're just not calling them that anymore. Next is Atrocitus, who I just, I am so tickled pink, or tickled red, I guess I should say, to see Atrocitus in here as a villain, and he's going to be red, and he's going to have the red effects, and ah, uh, so happy. A character, one of the very few comic book characters who I was there, I read his inception, his inaugural first appearance, so... That's a big deal for me, because that doesn't happen often. It just makes me happy that Atrocitus is here. Next is Mira, who makes me happy primarily because I love Aquaman's world so much, and I want as many characters from it as possible. So yeah, bring on the Mira. Now bring on her sister in Season 2. Sticking with that world, it's Ocean Master, Aquaman's arch-nemesis, uh, well, at least co-arch-nemesis with Black Manta, Ocean Master has been known to be an anti-hero, but I understand totally why they kept him red, because he's a pretty bad dude. Arm fall off, boy. This just makes me so happy. Come on. This is great. Uh, breaking new ground in United Miniature Design. Once again, uh, they do not sit on their laurels in this season at all, and he is a prime, if not the prime, example of that. Scarecrow's next. Not my favorite visual iteration of Scarecrow, but I don't care, because he is one of the best of the best Batman villains, so he had to be here. Dead Man, the ghost man who possesses other people. He's just a, a great longtime DC character who uh, is kind of underdogged in a way, so I like seeing him get some love here. The Penguin, now we're you know we're in the cream of the crop of Batman villains with the Penguin. He is going to be so much fun to battle with all of his different umbrellas, and I think he's going to be really fun to play as in the breakout mode. Something tells me he's going to be the most fun. I couldn't tell you why, I just have a gut feeling. Something about him just seems right for that mode. Shazam, aka Captain Marvel, aka Billy Batson. I'm really excited to see how they utilize the fact that he is an inexperienced little boy. Trust me, those cards of his are going to be a lot of fun. Booster Gold, and right after that, Blue Beetle. Uh, these two went so hand in hand, I couldn't bear to separate them, and I really like them both. I just like Blue Beetle more. I love his costume more. I love the look of his cards more, and I love Jaime Reyes' version of Blue Beetle even more, but maybe we'll get him one of these days. But both these guys are awesome. Star Sapphire, one of the most appropriately colored miniatures in the entire United System. So happy to see her here. Give Carol Ferris some love. This is exciting. You know how much I love this. Literally love this. That's the, the power she uses. Moving on. Mr. Freeze. And finally, our Batman and Robin recreation can begin. And I mean, come on. We have Arnold Schwarzenegger in United now. This changes everything. Swamp Thing is next. I really need to read the Alan Moore Swamp Thing comic because everybody says it's a masterpiece and I believe them. So one of these days I'll get around to that. In the meantime, I have Swamp Thing waiting for me in whatever, six and a half years when this game arrives. Jessica Cruz. I need to read her comics as well because as a professed Green Lantern fan, I feel ashamed that I haven't. She sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, probably the most fun Lantern since Kyle Rayner. And I just need to get to know her. And man, that axe on her miniature looks wicked. Martian Manhunter. Pretty much my favorite Justice Leaguer, really? Um, I mean, it flip-flops because the Justice League is so awesome. Like When he's around, you know you're reading a big event story. That's the best way I can put it. You know it's a big event story if you turn the page and you see Martian Manhunter's face. Jon Stewart, my favorite of the Green Lanterns. To me, he's classic Green Lantern. Even though Hal is vanilla, Jon is classic. And I find that there's a big distinction between those two. Reverse Flash is next because he's one of the DC villains that genuinely scares me. I feel like he's so powerful, there's nothing you could do to stop Reverse Flash. I'm terrified of the concept of fighting him, especially because you have to fight him three times, but it's gotta happen, right? I can't, I can't live in fear of this man my whole life. I have to live my life. Black Manta is next. I think he's one of the cooler looking villains in DC. His helmet is huge. He looks like a Funko Pop, but I don't care. He looks perfect in the movie, like spot on perfect. So let's get some Black Manta action in here. Doomsday, the first comic I ever owned was right after Superman died. So I was introduced to comics via the fallout of Doomsday. He casts a shadow over comics forever for me, in a good way. The idea of going up against him sounds more terrifying than going up against Reverse Flash, but somebody's got to fight him. Black Canary, my favorite of the Justice League adjacent 
characters, and also my favorite character to play as in Injustice 2. So yeah, I'm excited to see her here. Batgirl, the classic purple and yellow Batgirl. We were robbed of this movie. Thankfully, we were not robbed of this hero character. So thank you, Batgirl, for being front and center in the Gotham City box. Deathstroke, another just longtime stalwart DC villain who needed to be in this game. Like, there was no way we were not getting him. Firestorm. I, for whatever reason, was surprised when I saw the fire effects on him. I don't know why. I think I was just out to lunch that day or something. But when I saw that he had the, the translucent fire, I said, yay, this is even more exciting than I thought Firestorm would be. And he's a great character. So yeah, bring it on. King Shark. This dude is just so much fun. He had to be purple because he's kind of a big old softy, even though he eats and kills people. And I think he's a criminal mastermind too, even though sometimes they make him dumb. I don't know. There's a lot of versions of King Shark. But again, I welcome any new addition from Aquaman's world. Steel. I welcome any new addition from Superman's world too. Oh, I love the world building in DC Comics so much. Like every pocket is just a fun pocket to dig into and explore. And Steel is a beautiful, colorful part of the Superman pocket. John Henry Irons, uh, a normal man who's just such a good man that he takes up the mantle to protect Metropolis after Superman dies. That to me makes him such a great hero. And I'm not talking like superhero. I'm not talking the comic book sense. I'm talking of like a good human being, a paragon of goodness. That's Steel. He's outstanding. Two-Face, beautiful Batman villain. I am very, very excited by his mechanic with that coin. When they started off the campaign by talking about that coin, man, that just put stars and twinkles in my eyes. I can't wait to flip that coin. I, the, the tactileness of that is brilliant. Next is Hawkman, who's got arguably one of the most interesting origin stories in the entire DC universe. It's just great to have Hawkman here. And uh, right after him is Hawk Girl, who they usually go hand in hand. I just like her more because uh, I've seen her more. I've spent more time with her, particularly the Shaira version, though, the one from the Justice League cartoons. And Diversion Architect, I know you agree with me. Uh, it's So even though this isn't Shaira, it's close enough. I can pretend it is for now. Yeah, man, Hot Girl's the best. The question. I didn't think this would be a thing, but he, it's a thing. And he's got his little hat and he's got no face and he's got smoke. What more do you want? One of the most entertaining characters from the Justice League cartoon. He is definitely a pleasant surprise. Dr. Fate. When it comes to Cape Game, Dr. Strange and Dr. Fate... The two of them, man, I can't wait to team them up. The two sorcerers supreme of the comic book worlds, those two need to meet. I need to see what happens. Kyle Rayner. I prefer John Stewart to Kyle Rayner. Kyle Rayner is a very close second, but I have him this much higher than John just because this is the White Lantern Kyle Rayner. This is a big deal. I, I did not think we would see White Lanterns in this campaign whatsoever. So he bumped up higher on the list. Man, that miniature too. My God, like that's, that's something else. Saint Walker follows very, very close. He just is another character. I was there for his inception. I was there for all of these Lantern Spectrum characters' inceptions, and I can't wait. The thought of playing as Saint Walker is intoxicatingly fun. He's using his hope to bolster the hope of the rest of his teammates. Hell yeah. Cyborg Superman. In that comic book that I said was the first comic I ever got, the very last panel of it was the, I believe, first appearance of Cyborg Superman in a giant, glorious one-page uh, splash page. Just a terrifying villain and a kind of sympathetic one who's popped up a lot. I'm stoked for this guy. Starfire, my favorite Teen Titan. She's just awesome. I got a big old crush on Starfire. I love her. I'm really, really happy she's here. Polka Dot Man, uh, the Suicide Squad member needed to be in this game. Did I say King Shark was my favorite Suicide Squad member? I lied. It's Polka Dot Man. This, this guy is just so much fun. When I saw that his piece was going to be purple, I did a little figure eight spin around in my chair because I was so happy. He looks like a Wonder Bread bag, but I don't even care. Here. General Zod. Again, Superman villains are amazing, and yet they seem to get overlooked a lot, even though Zod is like the biggest Superman villain we've seen in movies in many, many, many years. But General Zod doesn't usually get a lot of love, so the fact that General Zod is now finally in a board game, that's a big deal to me. I, I'd like this. Yes, bring on all the Zod. Dark Side. 
Darkseid is one of my top 10, if not even top 5, DC villains. Uh, The only reason he is not higher on the list is because this particular version of Darkseid is a tiny bit off from the version I was sort of hoping for. But this Darkseid is awesome. I got nothing to complain about about him. I just, I thought they were going a different direction, so I'm just curious waiting to see how he plays supergirl my favorite hero in the uh the superman pocket of the universe there i thought she would be a stretch goal i was wrong but that's okay because we're still getting her she's awesome can't wait to fly around with supergirl zatanna sometimes she's a justice leaguer sometimes she's justice league adjacent sometimes she's justice league dark i don't know zatanna wears many hats mostly though she wears a top hat And in this miniature, she's pulling a tentacle out of it. This is so much fun. I love, love, love Zatanna. Next is Starro, the big old starfish man, who I think every fan immediately assumed he was the Fin Fang Foom of the DC United thing. Everybody went on that same wavelength. It was unanimous. So even though it wasn't a big surprise that he showed up the way he showed up, I think everybody was still delighted by him showing up. The Riddler is next. My all-time favorite Batman villain. I really want to know, like, if I can ask Andrea one question, my question to him would be, how difficult was it to come up with the mechanics for the Riddler? Because that had to be a big trial and error process, more so than most other villains. He's here. His cards are glorious. He looks like a lot of fun. Thank you for giving us uh, a classic-looking derby hat, question mark, staff, Riddler, because that's my favorite flavor of Riddler. I just realized we're in the top 10 now. Riddler was number 10. Number 9 is Parallax. This is because I did not expect Parallax to show up here. I thought that if we were to ever get a Parallax, it would be the Hal Jordan version of Parallax. Emerald Twilight, issue 50, giant metal shoulder pads, but I'm so glad we got this instead. He's a giant yellow bug. This is the most translucent plastic that Tiago has ever given us in one miniature, and I think we all owe him a great big thank you because it looks amazing. Next is Kilowog. Jon Stewart is my favorite of the main Green Lanterns, but Kilowog is my favorite member of the Green Lantern core, period. He's just the most fun character. He's always there. You know, you can't have the Green Lantern core without Kilowog. The main character may come in and out. It might be a revolving door system for our main hero, but Kilowog, you can always count on him to be there. So I've grown attached to him over the years reading Green Lantern, and I'm really happy they put him in this box. Next is Bizarro. First of all, they made me so happy when they finally made him purple, because he really should be purple. But then, the way they designed both his villain and hero mechanics is chef kiss. Again, a testament to the absolute pioneering genius that they continued to utilize when they made this campaign. They just kept breaking new ground, and Bizarro is the most new ground I have ever seen broken in one sitting. Magnificent. Sinestro is next, another one of my top five favorite DC villains ever, because as a Green Lantern guy, I have seen my fair share of Sinestro, and God, he's fun. He's just, he's one of those characters you love to hate, but you also love spending time with him. He's such a jerk to everybody, and he's snobby, but at times he can be anti-heroic. I understand that a lot of people wanted to see him purple and I was one of them but I get it red is fine too and he's got the yellow so that makes me happy I don't like when they show Sinestro in the Green Lantern outfit that doesn't it to me he's yellow and black he's not green and black that's that's just how I roll with Sinestro now next is Larflees because I didn't think Larflees would ever ever show up but lo and behold Here he is, despite the fact that I wanted him uh, and I put him on my wish list. It's like putting a ridiculous Christmas present on your wish list and then actually getting it. You're like, oh my God, you you found this? That's how I felt when I unwrapped Larflees that morning. Mr. Mixia's Pitlick is my number four. We're in the top four already. He was one of the ones I wanted to see the most. And I didn't think there was a huge chance we'd get him, but this season really showered love on the Superman villains. It really did. It didn't give us all of them, but it showered love on them, just like it did with Batman and with Wonder Woman's rogues. Mr. Mixie's Pitlick being here, it's a promise that there is more goodness to come with offbeat, weird, quirky characters. Number three is Salak, and I think mostly he falls this high because 
he might be my second favorite member of the Green Lantern Corps after Kilowog. Talk about never expecting to see him in a board game. I didn't, in my wildest dreams, expect him in a board game. The fact that he's here is a testament to what I believe is one of the United System's biggest strengths, which is including everyone. Inclusivity across the board of characters. It's the dupe principle, really, is what we should name it. If you can have dupe, you can have anybody. And Salak may not be everybody's favorite hero, but to me, he's a big deal. And to me, the fact that they brought him into the game is an even bigger deal. Because now I know so few people are off the table. Practically no one is off the table. Which leads us to number two, the Condiment King. I'll be honest, when I was first making this list, I didn't expect to end up ranking him this high. But every time I looked at that update, it just put a huge smile on my face. And I kept opening that update throughout the day, even as more kept getting unlocked. I just kept going back and looking at that and looking at those tokens with the, the mayonnaise and the mustard and everything. And I was just floored by how much damn fun the prospect of facing Condiment King is in this game. Especially because for me, playing randomly the way I do, selecting with a random number generator, I love the fact that literally the spin of a wheel is the difference between me fighting Condiment King and me fighting Thanos, right? It's insane. And he, as well, is a promise that no one is really off the table. Your most off-the-beaten-path choices are clearly not as off-the-beaten-path as we thought, because Simon has our backs when it comes to these characters. His presence here was just a warm hug that said, we're here to have fun. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Uh, I'll be very sad to see when the, the DC pledges start rolling out. I'll be very sad because I know I'm going to see plenty of people who are like, I'm selling my Condiment King because I don't want him. To me, the idea of having him as part of this game next to people like Thanos and Galactus and Sinestro, oh, that is joyous. And that leads us to number one, Indigo One. She has a one in her name. It did, that was a pure fluke that it worked out that way. Normally, a character in the, the War of Light who I would overlook because there's just so much going on and the Indigo Tribe is just one of many gorgeous things happening on the page. But then, the audacity of Tiago Urania to come out and show us that miniature with that staff in her hand and that swirling vortex of clear indigo power around her figure. I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful miniature in any United game. And that's a bold statement because we've all seen Ghost Rider Johnny Blaze. We've all seen Songbird. But no, I'm sorry. I have to give that trophy to Indigo 1. So it's a mixture of having the most beautiful miniature in this entire system, plus being a super low-key C-list character who I'm very familiar with, but I know a lot of people don't care about. Plus... The fact that she came packaged in the box that makes me the most excited. Plus, she is just a, a ton of fun as an anti-hero because at the end of the day, anti-heroes are, are great and they, they offer the most gameplay variety. So I could not have put her anywhere else. And I was not expecting Indigo 1 to be my number one character going into this. I was expecting, you know, Mr. Mixie's Pitlick or Riddler or whatever. So the fact that she ended up this high is a testament to how much they pleasantly surprised me with everything she had to offer. So that is my number one most anticipated character in DC Superheroes United. And that's the ball game, folks. Those are all of the characters. Uh, sorry it took so long, but hey, there were a lot of characters in this campaign, so it was a lot to get through. I don't think it was quite as many as Multiverse, because Multiverse, we also kind of included Spider-Geddon, but man, this was close. For a season one, they really pulled out not all of the stops, but a hell of a lot of the stops. So that'll do it for me for today. Let me know how much you absolutely disagree with me in the comments below. Let me know who your most and least uh, excited for character might be. I'm really curious. Uh, I know a few of you have told me, but uh, I'm curious just to hear the general consensus. Which character has the most excitement built around them based off of fans? So we'll see what that looks like once the comments start rolling in. Anyway, I'm out of here. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I will see you all here next time as we continue to make the wait for Marvel United Multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you then. The sun is in my eyes!